Thank you so much for being a part of worship today. I'm glad that you're tuning in. I'm glad you're singing along, sharing comments, sharing this service with your friends. We love that you're participating like you are, and I'm honored to welcome you to worship here today. It won't be too long until I get to worship with some of you face-to-face. -face. Uh, June the 7th is our planned date to begin having in-person services again. There'll be lots of limitations and challenges with that. We're communicating about those through email, through the church website, and through the church Facebook page. You can find information there. We will also continue to worship online for those of you who are not able to be with us in person. We're going to keep that going and love to have all of you with us from wherever you are. I want to let you know that some wonderful people in our church are graduating from high school, and we're going to celebrate them now. Take a look at this video. So glad to have you here this morning in worship. We stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, and that's what we want you to join with us and sing. Would you do that? It's a great old hymn, and this is a great ar arrangement. Sing with me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Here we go. Sing with me. Oh.
Boys and girls, I'm so glad you joined me this morning for worship. Over the last few weeks, we've been learning about God's plan for your life. The first week, we learned that God loves you and has a plan for your life. And then we talked about how we have all sinned, but that God loves us so much that even though we choose to sin, He still loves us and offers to forgive us. And this week, we're going to learn that Jesus died for you. So we're going to learn some hand motions real quick. Do you know how to say Jesus in sign language? What you do is you take one finger and point it to the middle of your palm, and then you take the other finger and point it to the middle of this palm. So it goes, Jesus. Can you try that with me? Jesus. So when we say Jesus, then we're gonna say died. So you then take your hands and make a cross with your arms and then point to yourself for me. So it goes, Jesus died for me. Can we try that together? Jesus died for me. Great job. Okay, what I want you to do is take five seconds and in your house or your living room, wherever you're watching this video, I want you to shout out everything you know about Jesus. Are you ready? Go. Awesome, great job. So Jesus, we know, is God's son. He was fully God and fully human. And Christmas is when we celebrate Jesus's birthday. Did you know that Jesus never sinned? That's right, he was perfect, he never sinned. That means he never disobeyed his parents. That means he never lied. That means he never said mean things to his siblings. Jesus never sinned and he was perfect. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus was an adult, he died on the cross. Do you know why Jesus died? Jesus died to take the punishment for our sin. A few weeks ago, we learned that the Bible tells us that the punishment for our sin is death. And Jesus died as the punishment for our sin. It's kind of like if you were gonna get in trouble for lying to your parents. And the punishment was that you had to do time out for 30 minutes. So you lied, you got in trouble, and the punishment was time out for 30 minutes. And then your big brother came along and said, you know what, I love you so much that I'm gonna take the time out instead of you. You don't have to take that punishment, I'm gonna go in time out instead. Can you imagine your brother doing that for you? Well, that's kind of like what Jesus did for us. Jesus took the punishment that we deserve. The Bible says we deserve death for our sins and he took our place. He took that punishment for us. Um, but do you know what happened after three days after he died? That's right, he rose again three days later. Jesus didn't stay dead. Um, we're gonna read a Bible verse that you're probably familiar with. It's John 3, 16. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Anyone who believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. It says that because Jesus died, we have a chance 
for eternal life. Um, you, When you become a Christian, you have a chance to get your sins forgiven. You can have a relationship with God and you can know that when you die, you can spend eternity with God, which is some awesome, great news. Next week, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to exactly you become a Christian. But this week, I want you to remember, Jesus died for me. Can we do that together? Jesus died for me. Great job, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for worship this morning and that um, we know that Jesus died for our sins. Thank you so much that you loved us so much that even while we were still sinners, you sent Jesus to die um, so that we can be forgiven and so that we can have a relationship with you. I pray that you focus our minds and our hearts on you as we worship this morning. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Sing 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O oh my soul. I worship your holy sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Worship His holy 
God's great hand Other times No matter what I do Only silence And I don't understand But looking back All the pieces Fall in place And God knew What I needed After joy of broken blessings and the treasure hidden deep within the testing I'm thankful for the days when the world has turned my way but I'm thankful even more for broken blessings Is written in the scars For years I tried to hide away On my skin Or hidden in my heart But each is part Of who I am today Reminding me The purpose and the pain of the one who wore his scars for my sake. Oh, the joy of broken blessings and the treasure hidden deep within the testing. I'm thankful for the days when the world has turned my way. Even more for broken blessings. If I never had disappointments in this life, I'd never feel God wipe away each tear. Oh, the joy. broken blessings and the treasure hidden deep within the testing I'm thankful for the days when the world has turned my way but I'm thankful even more for broken blessings God, thank you. For broken blessings. Today's reading is from Romans 8, verses 28 and 31 through 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? 
Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're continuing our series of messages called God is Never Distant. And we're exploring the news that even in this time when we have to be physically apart from people, God is near. He is with us, and I'm glad that you're a part of that. We're going to be digging into a wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8 for each of the next two Sundays. And some of the Flint family just read that for us. I want to say thanks to Lance and Roscoe for reading, and thanks to Jennifer for her good direction and cinematography. Uh, we're going to dive specifically into one verse of that passage today and the rest of it next week. We're going to look today at Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a remarkable promise, one of the most amazing promises in Scripture. And we're going to see some really good news today. But before we get to the good news, we need to be aware of some bad news. This passage of Scripture makes it clear that life hurts life hurts. And we could fill up the little comments thing on Facebook, on the Facebook video with examples of that, with proof of that from your own lives. All of us have pain that we have experienced. We don't all have the same pain, but we all experience difficulty. And maybe the main source of your hurt is an empty chair in your living room right now. Maybe your main source of hurt is something unspeakable that you experienced as a child that still haunts you to this day. Maybe your source of pain is something very recent, something that happened this weekend. Maybe it's medical, maybe it's financial, maybe it's academic, maybe it's relational. Whatever it is, I know that you experience pain. Maybe it's a mix and match of all those different things. But sometimes it feels like this tile is you and this hammer is life, and we get broken to pieces. We are living our lives, and all these terrible things happen, and they just break us apart from the inside out. And we find ourselves shattered and left in pieces, and life hurts. But with this bad news that life hurts, We've got some really good news from Romans 8, 28, that God can make something beautiful with the broken pieces of our lives, that God is at work for our good. Romans 8, 28 is the scripture, and I would love for you to say this out loud with me where you are, just a little phrase at a time. I'll say it. You repeat after me. It says, and we know that in all things, God works. God works for the good. God works for the good of those who love him. I could almost hear you through the camera. Thank you for reading that scripture together. We have a promise here that God is always at work for our good. Even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of the difficulties that we experience, God is at work. When life does its worst, God is at work doing his best, and he has big plans for your broken pieces. He has big plans to continue to do good things. Now, this verse, though, it's one of the most reassuring in the whole Bible. It might also be one of the most misunderstood and misquoted verses in the whole Bible. So before we can be really clear about what Romans 8, 28 says, we need to be clear about what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that everything that happens is God's will. That's what we wish it said, that we would feel better about life if we could confidently say that every single event that happens in my life, every single circumstance is God's desire, it is God's will, it is what God wants to see happen. But that's actually not the teaching of biblical Christianity. Islam teaches that. Islam says whatever happens, Allah wills it. But biblical Christianity teaches something different we would like to have the security 
of knowing that God is king, and of course he is, and knowing that he is sovereign, and of course he is, and about the only way we can envision how that would work is if he decides and causes every single thing that happens. But that's not the way it is. It's not necessarily true as much as people tell us when we're hurting and they try to comfort us by saying, oh, it must be the Lord's will. Have you heard that before? I don't know about you, but that's not all that helpful sometimes when I'm going through deep pain and somebody says, oh, well, you know, it must be the Lord's will. And I'm thinking, what kind of God is that? What kind of God would want me to hurt like this? That's not very helpful. And it's not even necessarily true. Was it God's will for Adam and Eve to take the fruit and disobey his direct command? Was it God's will for Hitler to do all the damage that he did? When you look in the newspaper and you see the headlines, you look online and try to follow the news and you see all the coronavirus deaths and you see the fatal shooting of a police officer in Overland Park and horrible things happening. Does God want those things to happen? Certainly he allows them to happen. But that is not to say that he wants them to happen. It is not to say that they are his will, his intention. Part of living in a fallen world is that things happen that are outside the will of God. We have broken things with our sinfulness, and that causes things to happen. That causes things to get messed up. And part of our freedom that God has entrusted to us comes with the live option of disobeying him and doing what is not his will. And sin, by its very definition, is rebellion against God, rebellion against the will of God, rebellion against the way God wants things to be. So Romans 8.28 does not say that God causes everything that happens or that everything that happens is God's will. It says that in all things, those things that are within his will and those things that are outside his will, God works toward good. A second thing that this verse obviously does not say is it doesn't say that God always does what I want. Romans 8, 28, we read it and we see that it says in all things God works for the good of those who love him and we think, oh great, that means he's going to heal my sick loved one. That means he's gonna take that coworker who drives me nuts and transfer them to the Siberia office. That means I'm gonna get what I want. We want God to work by taking away the source of our pain. That's what we would like to see happen. And sometimes he does that, but not always. What we want and what is best for us is not always the same thing. God is always at work for our good, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's always going to do what we want. Another thing this verse does not say is it doesn't say that only good things will happen to me if I love God. Sometimes we take this and make it this nice little glib promise as if there's a guarantee that if you just love God enough, you'll have this magic force field to protect you from all dangerous and bad things and you'll never have a check bounce and you'll never have somebody say anything ugly to you and everything will always turn up rosy. But that's not the way it is. Bad things will still happen. Look at the life of Jesus if you just want a tiny bit of evidence of the fact that not all good things happen to the person who loves God. Bad things might still happen, but God uses them for good. He can turn them around and he can bring good out of them. So maybe you have a serious car accident and you would never say perhaps that, oh, it's a good thing that this happened, but you can see good things that God brought from it. Maybe you built a relationship with someone in the hospital that he used to help you or to help that person. Maybe he used the time while you were rehabbing to give you some time to be quiet and read scripture and pay attention to him. Good things happened, and God uses even the bad things that happened for his good purposes. Author Mark Buchanan says this, Christianity does not provide a supernatural cure for suffering. It provides a supernatural use of it. God doesn't magically dispel suffering, at least not most times. He enters into the thick of it and uses it to accomplish something in us and often through us that no amount of pleasure or success could ever produce. Romans 8, 28 does not say that only good things will happen to us if we love God, it says that in all things that happen to us, the good things and the bad things, God is at work for our good. So now that we've swept away some of those misconceptions, easy for me to say, let's talk about what this verse actually does say. It promises loud and clear a guarantee from God that God is at work. God is not 
just a passive observer of your life. God is not just up in heaven with his arms crossed wondering what's going to happen to you just watching it unfold. He's involved. God is at work. He is not leaving you alone to sink or swim in the circumstances around you. He is active. He is involved. He's getting his hands dirty. He's at work. And specifically, God is at work for your good. God has a plan for your life, a good plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says that that I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God plans to do good things in you and through you, and he is at work to bring those plans about. And it might seem like your boss is working to make you miserable and your spouse is working to drive you crazy and the devil is working to make you be full of despair, but God is working for your good. He's working hard for your good. And I can see at least three ways that God tends to work for our good. Sometimes he's at work to change your situation. Often he reaches in and rearranges things around you so that the thing that is causing you pain can be used for other purposes. A gloomy day gets interrupted by some unexpected good news or a situation that looked like a total disaster gets turned around. Somebody comes along and offers help at just the right time. Now, God doesn't always work this way. He doesn't always fix our circumstance. He doesn't always make things the way that we want, but sometimes he reaches in and he calms that storm around us and he gives that supernatural help in our circumstances. Another way that he tends to work for our good is to help us grow. Sometimes his main work in our painful circumstances is not to take away the pain, but to use the pain for his good in our lives, to use the heavy load that we are carrying to build our spiritual muscles. God's work sometimes helps us through the pain that we experience. When I ask people to, det- to tell me about the spiritual high points of their lives, I'm surprised at how often they tell me about an experience of pain, about how it was going through a divorce and finding God to be faithful in the midst of that divorce, or how it was a, a terrible medical crisis or the loss of a loved one and God's presence was near and his comfort was real. It is amazing how often it is those experiences of pain that help us to know that he is at work. Maybe he uses a disaster to help you grow as a disciple. Maybe he uses a family crisis to lead to a a renewed family closeness. Maybe he uses some heartbreak to cause your heart to beat with his. So God works around you sometimes, changing your circumstances. He works in you sometimes to make you stronger, and he can work through you. One of the ways that he works sometimes is to use your pain for others' gain. It's amazing how he can take someone who has been through the struggle of addiction and who's recovering in their addiction and help other people who are struggling with addiction because they know that that person understands where they are. They know that that person has been there. They have a a sense of credibility and, and they're more sensitive to the pain. It's amazing how when someone experiences deep loss of a, of a loved one, how they can then be used to bring comfort to someone else who is grieving because that grieving person knows that they've been there. God can use the painful experiences of your life to help you help others in his name. God's at work. God is at work for your good. And one more thing this verse tells us is that God is at work for your good in all things. This is not a part-time promise. This is not an occasionally God does this promise. This is an all the time, every day, take it to the bank, guarantee that he is at work for your good in all things things. When you're having the best day of your life, God's at work for your good. When it feels like the wheels are coming off, God is at work for your good. When you have uh, just a series of little brush fires all day long, little minor disasters, God is at work for your good. When everyone you know who loves you has abandoned you, it seems, God is at work for your good. When you're on the spiritual mountaintop or when you're not even sure God's even there, he is at work for your good. Even in the middle of a global pandemic, God is at work for your good. I've seen evidence of the truth of Romans 8.28 in our church. 
there are bad things that are happening. There are so many frustrations and, and so much fear and so many dangerous and difficult things. But in the midst of it, God's been at work for good. He's used this crisis to give our church opportunities to bless others in some remarkable ways as we've been able to give to people who work at downtown businesses and people at, at uh, Lee Summit Social Services, as we've been able to show appreciation to healthcare workers at St. Luke's East Hospital, we have had opportunities he has presented. He's taken this bad thing and he's brought good out of it. We've seen that happen as God has extended the church's reach through these online services. There are people who are listening right now who before had no connection to our church and maybe even no connection to Christ, and, and God has worked for our good through all of this. We've seen it happen in individual lives as well. Many of you have shared with me how this strange season, with all of its pain and frustration, has helped you to reevaluate the pace of your life and the things that you're gonna put back on your plate once you can fill that plate back up might be a little different now that you have experienced the time to breathe and spend time with family and not just go, go, go all the time. Nothing will ever happen that will catch God off guard. No hardship will ever come to you that will make God say, oh, that's a bummer. I wonder how they're gonna survive that. He always is involved and he always is at work for our good in all things. Life does its worst. The enemy says, I'm going to send this difficulty. I'm going to break this person. I'm going to tear them apart. But God says, I'm going to turn it around and make it a blessing. I'm going to work in the midst of that pain to bring something beautiful, to use it for good. In the Bible, we'll read the story of Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son of his father. His father gave him lots of extra blessings, including some special clothes, and his brothers were jealous, and so they threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And he experienced difficulty after difficulty. He became a slave. He was imprisoned. But through it all, he was faithful to God, and God was at work, and God raised him to a position of leadership in the whole nation of Egypt and used his wisdom to provide relief in a time of, of big regional famine when even Joseph's brothers, not knowing that Joseph was in that position of leadership, had to come to him and beg for food. And they found out that it was Joseph. And they knew, oh man, this guy has every right to just tear us apart for what we did to him, what we put him through. But Joseph speaks these words in Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Life may intend to harm you. Other people may intend to harm you, but God intends it for good. In all things, he is at work for your good. And the clearest proof of the truth of Romans 8, 28 is the cross, where the world and the devil were doing their worst, causing the suffering and death of the pure and perfect Son of God. And God took that awful thing and turned it into the most beautiful thing, the best thing, the redemption of all of us, the possibility for all of us to be forgiven, to have our sin washed away, to have us brought to him as children of God. Two concluding thoughts. One is that God promises when we are hurting, he is working. We ask the question sometimes, where's God when we hurt? The answer is he is at work. He's not absent, he's not caught off guard, he's not ignoring you, he's not intimidated by the issues you face. He is at work for your good. And along with that promise, I want to challenge you to pray a prayer. Lord, make something beautiful from the broken pieces of my life. He may take all those broken pieces and put them back together. He may take all those broken pieces and turn them into a beautiful mosaic, something more beautiful than what you had before. He might work in ways you can't imagine. God is at work. He's always at work. He's always at work for your good. We're going to sing a song of commitment together now. Right there where you are, sing with us these familiar words of commitment to Jesus Christ. I have decided 
to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. If you have been moved by what you've experienced in worship today, if you'd like to talk to someone about how to get to know Jesus better, about how to give your life to him, we would love to hear from you. You can send us a message through Facebook. You can send us a message through our church website as you uh, can, can use a contact form there. You can send me an email, blake.m at firstls.church. You can come by the church office. We're now open again. We'd love to see you. Please reach out if we can help you in any way. If you know of a need we can meet, please make us aware of that. Thank you so much for being a part of worship today. We're going to go with a blessing from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.